Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. The program today is presented by the Grown Ups Forum, which is a member-led forum. And we create um, programs that hopefully interest people in the second half of life. So if you have any ideas for speakers or um, topics, please leave me afterwards, um, or submit your ideas to the front desk at any time. So tonight, we're pleased to um, introduce Dr. Luanne Brizendine. She wrote her new book called The Upgrade, How the Female Brain Gets Stronger and Better in Midlife and Beyond. She'll be interviewed by Katie Hafner, a journalist and author and host of a podcast called uh, Lost Females in Science. She'll also be back here in July to um, discuss her own new book called The Boys. Um, if you uh, have any questions for Dr. Brizentine, if you could write them on your on this um, um, card that I can pass out later, and if you are listening online, if you are listening online, please submit your questions in the text chat of YouTube. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Luann Brizentine and Katie Hafner. <laughs> Wow, real people. I know, a real yeah. audience. <laughs> so nice, so nice. Well, I, um, I am so happy to be here. Uh, the last Commonwealth Club event I did, it was completely alone with cameras, and it felt so lonely. So what a nice thing to do, and especially to be up here with, um, with Luann, Dr. Luann Brizendine, um, to talk about her new book. Uh, so Dr. Brizendine, or Luann, is that okay? Okay. <laughs> Luann is um, the founder of the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic at UCSF. She founded it in 1993. It was the first in the country, uh, which is amazing. And then she made a huge splash in 2006 with a book called The Female Brain. And I remember reading that, and which was epiphanous to me. And uh, now we have this, which completely surprised me. Uh, and it's, I just have to say, everybody over the age of... 40. 40. <laughs> 40, really? OK, well. Well, we'll get into that. Everybody has got to read this book. It was an absolute revelation to me. Um, I had no idea that you were even doing it. I've known um, Luann for a very long time, and I had absolutely no idea that you were working on this book. So tell me why you, what compelled you to do it? Why would I slog away for four or five years? Yet another, yes. not another book. No, right? I know. Well, you know, um, what happened is, of course, you know, the female brain, when I wrote that, I was like in, in, in my early 50s, it came out. And so um, I wrote that book up to the point of life that I knew something about. And then, you know, I got on and on and on into my 50s and into my early 60s. And I realized, oh my gosh, you know, there's so much in my own experience that I really would like to write about that um, I would like to, to give to the younger women that I know that are going to be going through it. So I felt compelled to do that, to help women going through this stage of life and, and give them hope that it's not all over. <laughs> it's not all over at 40 or 50. So what was happening t- to you in your 50s? So, you know, of course, I went through the, the what I call the transition, a.k.a. perimenopause, and the upgrade of the, the menopause in... Um, you know, my early 50s, late 40s. And that, you know, that was a, a rock and roll time, certainly. And um, 
as I got through the other side of that, though, I realized, wow, you know, I'm feeling better than ever. I feel more kind of on fire, on purpose about things in my life than I ever had felt for, for many, many years. So I felt like that was a surprise to me, and I mm. wanted to think about it and dive deeper into kind of some of the brain and hormone reasons about that. So I felt like I was compelled to write this book about that, that stage. That's so nice. I hope that a lot of people are writing out questions. We want this to be very interactive because it's really about us, and I'm being pretty inclusive. I mean men, too, because it's all about the relationships that women have later in life as well and how it is that we live in our skin as as I understand it and I was thinking okay how if I were to describe this book to someone just me as a reader and I have all these dog ears it would be act, it would be everyone these are actually the best years of your life and I want you to walk us through that first scientifically why or do you agree <laughs> do i agree yes so i mean thank I, god we're not in our 20s wouldn't that just be a horrible <laughs> nightmare yeah so so let's contextualize it for a minute because and i apologize a little bit to the audience we're not looking directly at like because because we have lights in our eyes it's hard to see you so i know that hello to all of you out there that that i do know and thank you for some of my former students who are now also in the upgrade for coming um the, the contextualization that I wanted to start with is that we know from research studies, many of them, that actually each decade of our life, thinking about the 20s, you know, each decade of our life, we get happier and happier. And it's known in the biz, in the research biz, as the positivity effect. Hmm. So I, this is kind of like that's the big umbrella for, for men and women. And I think that's a little known piece of information. And they've studied it all the way up into the decade of the 90s. I think they probably couldn't get, you know, they had as many people as they could get in their 80s and up into their 90s. So, you know, if you go back to our 20s and 30s, let's take a look at what's happening, you know, with the menstrual cycle. Because one thing to remember is that the purpose of a hormone is to create a behavior. So give us some examples. So the hunger hormones make you eat, right? The sex hormones make you crazy. Crazy, <laughs> make you <laughs> seek, search for a sexual partner, right? So those things we're very, very aware of and used to. Um, and I think for women, this is something that men don't have, is that, that the up and down of the estrogen and progesterone of the menstrual cycle of the four weeks that we start at about age average age of 12 mm -hmm. and go up until the average age of 51. So for a big chunk of that part of our life, we are we're on this wa these waves of hormones. And why that's important is the first two weeks of the cycle, day one is day one of bleeding, so you count forward from that. That's when the estrogen is going up high. And it starts to peak about two or three days before ovulation. And the behavioral effects of that actually may surprise you, Katie, but it makes you be more flirtatious, wear a little more makeup, be a little more come hither. I read that, yeah. Um, that was and key. It's really key because the fertility, the fertility dance is, for women is all like, you know, comes to a head like four or five mm -hmm. days before ovulation. I said, that's how Mother Nature, nature made, she made it, so that we would get pregnant and procreate. So that's what's really going on in terms of the behavioral effects of the female hormones in the brain during the fertility years. And then, of course, it all turns around during the last part of the cycle. So it's constantly right. this ebb and flow, ebb and flow, remaking the circuitry, the actual synapses in parts of our brain change from week to mm -hmm. week, all during those years, until... The upgrade. So you call it the, uh, the, the full title of this amazing book is The Upgrade, How the Female Brain Gets Stronger, note that, and better in midlife and beyond. So what beef do you have with the word menopause? So, you know, the words perimenopause and menopause are, I, ca I call them fossil words <laughs> because they are words that were made by the pharmaceutical industry and the medical 
community to to denotate a a condition of deficit you know the deficit of the hormones and it's not the whole it's not the whole woman approach i mean it doesn't talk about all of the other multi-layered transitions that we're going through in our life as women of you know changing with of our fertility years changing of raising children changing all of those that complexity of the entirety of who we are is not captured in the the perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause titles. Those are medical words that have to do with medical conditions. So I just decided to throw them out and talk about something that was going to be the, the whole woman approach mm-hmm. to this transition and upgrade in our lives. I see. So, um, it, and there's something about language, the very language you use, and I just want to get it straight. I want to get your language straight. So the transition is from when to when, and then the upgrade is the is the transition taking us to the upgrade. Is that what happens? So I say transition, aka perimenopause, in some ways. And that the 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 I call it, and I break the transition up into four pieces because I want women to be able to also know what stage they're at if they're going through this. And the early pre-transition is probably age 37 to 41 or 42, which is when we've. You know, that's my, my, some of my nieces are getting to that mm-hmm. stage. And, you know, that is a stage when your, your eggs are starting to run out. Remember, we have about a million when we're born. We don't right. get any more. By the time we hit 37, we're just about to, starting to run out. So that's the pre-transition. And 42 to 45 is that early transition where your ovaries are starting to sputter a bit because they're not making as much estrogen as they Mm -hmm. used to. And then your pituitary gets very aggravated at that stage Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it's not seeing as much estrogen as it wants. So it starts to scream at the ovary to make more. And sometimes on some days during that transition years, it will squirt out a whole bunch more than it's even used to, like sometimes in the middle of your cycle. And, you know, it just kind of messes mm-hmm. messes with your mind, so to speak, during those years. So that's what's going on through the, through the transition. And then I say, as you finish the transition at about the stage of about 51 on average, then you go into the upgrade. That's when you've kind of shed the skin of the fertility hormone surges and mm-hmm. you've come into this new new life where you're not having your brain torn down built up torn down built up this. right and then uh, so i have to tell you while i was reading this i was thinking of something my mother said used to say to me actually pretty frequently when i would call her and whine and moan and cry about men and she'd say, oh, just wait until your hormones all like go away. It'll all be fine, and you'll be happy. And, and I thought, oh, my gosh. She's, and now it's like, oh, my gosh, she was so right. <laughs> and, I, when I, and then I thought, maybe I should add up all the hours that I spent like, on that ridiculous <laughs> quest, whatever it was. But now, but reading this, and also my mother's wide, wise words, it was... You're, there was a reason, and it's kind of not my fault, right? Bingo. You know, you just said something that I think is so important for every woman to hear. It's not my fault. And I think that that's also true. You know, just if, if a hormone's purpose is to make a behavior, it would be like saying it's, it's your fault that you're hungry, right? right? So it's not your fault that you're hungry. It's not your fault that, you're, that you've shed, shed that skin. <laughs> you're not sitting. You're not sitting in your apartment waiting for some guy to oh, call God. you for days. <laughs> that whole mess. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I'm a little confused by something, which is hormone replacement therapy. If we were happy to get rid of them, why do we want them? So, can you please address this? Okay, we want the good part, not the bad part. Right. So that's a really important question, and um, the the ideal is. And the, the reason, so the ideal status in the upgrade is that you have a consistency of the hormone that's going to be healthy for you. Let's say estrogen, progesterone. And you're, you're wanting to not be on this wave of cycling and cycling that every day, every week, something is changing. So once you go on, if you are on HRT of some kind, the most women do. I mean, in some days they used to, ask, some women ask to be cycling and have menstrual periods still up until their 80s and 90s. Most women do not want that anymore. They don't want to walk down that aisle in the grocery store ever again. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so um, mostly 
women like the continuous version of the hormone. So it's steady, it's stable, you're able to really kind of have your feet on the ground and know how you're going to feel from day to day. And you're not going to have hot flashes and brain fog and sweating and not sleeping well and joint aches and pains, etc. So what you've said is that there was a, there has been this controversy over hormone replacement therapy. And let's talk about that because it's very important because there's a whole generation of women who then I just aren't on it. So let's talk about that. So um, we are now celebrating in 2022 the 20th anniversary of the Women's Health Initiative results of 2002, which within months got every doctor to sort of... Wait, what was the Women's Health Initiative? Women's Health Initiative was a long study started in the 90s, giving one big group of women a hormone replacement and another group placebo. So that's the standard, mm. that's the gold standard in, in science of clinic, clinical care of testing a placebo against an active ingredient, this, in this case, the hormones. And so um, that study came out and, um, in 2002 and announced that all the good things we were, that we, some, we found some bad things. We found that um, when they reanalyzed the data after five and a half years of, on the hormone group, there was a 0.1% increase in breast cancer. 0.1% meaning? Over the placebo group. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was clearly very small, but, but, but it, wasn't, it wasn't put in exactly that way at that time. So I, don't, I just want to honor the fact that the media just took that and really ran with it, and it kind of exploded everywhere, even mm -hmm. into the medical profession, and women were taken off of it. Um, so that's why, that's why everybody was taken off of it. There's been a whole generation of doctors that have not been even trained in how to give hormone replacement therapy. Really? Like, as a matter of fact, wait till you hear this little piece of information. It'll blow your mind. Um, in OBGYN residencies to this day, only 20% of them get any lecture at all in hormone replacement therapy. Wow. Okay. And of the women OBGYNs that, that, they, that they surveyed five years ago, found that even though they, they the OBGYN, female OBGYNs, were taking hormone replacement themselves, they often didn't recommend it to their patients because they, they, were, they were scared because of that. So, so let's fast forward. There's women then have been out there without access to any hormone replacement during these years, which I feel... I feel very badly about that because some of the women definitely need it. But in the reanalysis of all of the data, they found that the women, they, they, the study started, the average age that they started women on the hormones in the study was 64 years old. 14 years after, wow, 14 years after their menopause, their last period. And then they did a deeper analysis and found out that a whole bunch of women in the in one group had already had strokes and heart attacks, and some of them, you know, had had already had breast cancer. You know, so there were it was a mess. So the data ended up being a mess, of course, and now it's been reanalyzed and felt that it was a very flawed study. Um, however, it, it you know, and sp some of my friends at the at the NIH at the time told me, Luann, we hate to tell you this, but this is going to set women's research in estrogen replacement and estrogen back by 20 years. And of course, they told me that in 2002, and I couldn't possibly believe it, but here we are 20 years later, and that is the case. So they also threw a bunch of women that had the breast cancer gene in there. They didn't separate out women with a breast cancer gene from the study. I know we, we look at it now, I mean, to be fair, you know, 2020 hindsight, <laughs> it's, it, 2020 hindsight is one thing, right? And so lots of mistakes were made. It was a mess. But it's important to know that, you know, if you are someone that does have the breast cancer gene, then you shouldn't take hormone replacement therapy. So set that group aside. For all other women, you know, as long as you're getting your annual mammograms <coughs> and you are having horrible, 80% um, of women have hot flashes and mood swings and trouble sleeping and achy joints and brain fog, you know, as they go through this stage. And I, I feel that women should at least be given the opportunity to have a doctor that knows what they're doing to try to help them through this phase. So 
um, the uh, North American Menopause Society and other groups find it um, that the five to 10 years in this period of life um, is a time when um, there's very little change at all in your risk to breast cancer if you take out the women that have had the genetic breast cancer risk. So it's great to talk with your doctor about it. Go in there and just sit down and talk about all your family risk factors, all the things that, um, that you want to, to talk with them about and have them become your, I call them, find a medical partner. Find a medical partner to help you through these years is what I would say to women now. So that's where we are. That's the... <laughs> That's my soapbox for that. <coughs> Sorry, but and I just have some very yeah. strong feelings about this because I've been living with it, through it with lots of my women patients for the past 20 years. And so the women who came to my clinic, of course, the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic, also had the added part of having a mood disorder or an anxiety disorder right. on top of it. And often they did very badly without their estrogen. And so they were very much helped by having, having their estrogen and not going through the two to three time increase in depressed mood during this transition years. And without treatment, you know, women really suffer. I think the, I can remember the one thing that really stood out to me, uh, women that came to my clinic would say something. I remember it's one woman in particular, had two kids, great life, you know, was, it was, you know, she said, Dr. Brizendine, you know, I really feel like I have a great life. I know that I do, but if it weren't for my husband and kids, I, I really wouldn't want to be here anymore. I don't, I don't want to go on living this way. I don't, the joy has completely gone out of my life. So, you know, sometimes that black curtain just comes down and you can't see forward. And, of course, we put her on, you know, her hormone replacement therapy, and uh, we got her sleeping again, and she ended up feeling a lot better within about three or four months. So I just feel that we need to open our minds again and encourage women to find partners, knowing that the medical profession out there is still like 20 years behind in trying to help women through this transition into the upgrade. So that, that, by the way, you guys, is just one of many, many things that Luann t talks about in this book. This is a very layered book. And by that, I mean that it's got a lot of science. There's all the... All the in fact, you, you front load this thing with a bunch of science and pictures and hypothalamus and amyg amygdala and hip we, we you don't have to go through it but it's good to I think it's she um, you really do explain it really well and then of course I forget it again but um, <laughs> but you know where to find it in the front of but I know where to but find it you know it. you don't really need to know any science you don't you have do to know you do not any need to, to know any book, science to read yeah. this book so the other thing that you do and what makes it so layered and wonderful is the stories that you weave through here, and the woman you just described sounds familiar to me. She's she's in here, and one I of think my I call her Patricia. Right, <laughs> but <clears throat> I, I did changed all the names to protect people. Um, and one of the, my favorites is this woman Rhonda, um, and this has and so this, we're moving into this the, the discussion of cognition and exercise. And why don't you talk about that? Because I, you know, here I am, kind of gilding the lily, saying. The, and I can speak personally, I feel like these are the best years of my life. All that hormone stuff is behind me. I'm happily married. That's all good. I, I'm doing more professionally than I have ever done, which is crazy. And, um, and I do, however, worry that I'm kind of losing it. So <laughs> talk about that and what we, and what we truly can do. And okay. no, and you forgot to tell everybody that you're actually a better tennis player now <laughs> than ever. No, I'm worse, but <laughs> I keep going. I do keep yeah. going, and and in fact, we can talk about what you said about leg strength and all of that. So, um, yeah. So one thing I'd like to just one little study that I just caught my attention when I was reading all the literature was there was this there was a very cool study of women in their 80s, and they kind of had them stratified according to how cognitively intact they were. So the women in the best top category of cognition at 80, the highest correlation of anything that they tested for these women was their leg strength. But why, why their leg strength? I mean, what, 
prompted so, them to say, oh, maybe it's your leg. Well, I don't think that they thought about that in advance. It just popped out of the study. You know, this is how things happen. They, yeah. they looked at a lot of things for these women, you know, not just <laughs> their strength, but the leg strength. And I, they made, maybe they didn't test bicep strength. I don't know what they, that they tested, you know, that maybe the, the, the strength of their legs and being able to, you know, push, push certain amount of weights. But I think that what, why that caught my interest is they also know that, that muscles secrete a lot of, of compounds into your blood when they're contracting and they're moving that actually go to the brain and stimulate the brain. So we've known that for a long time, and they have a lot of big fancy names for all those chemicals the muscles release into the blood that stimulate your brain. So um, I thought, wow, that is really cool correlation with cognition. And so that made me do a deeper dive, which I go into some in the book about how, you know, how muscle strength um, actually helps your cognition. And um, if you don't do anything else, anything else is to just like, even just walking around the block for 20 minutes a day. And in San Francisco, you could get a Yeah, lot. you could get going to the blocks here. You could have some <laughs> cardio by going up and down the hills. So it's, you know, cardio, the cardio three times a week for 30 minutes is like, the, you know, the gold standard. And so there, there's much, I'm sure a lot of you in this room are a lot more active than that. But just the basics of continuing to keep moving. What I also tell women is that, um, and I actually put a, I put a little, I do these some of these time, 10 or 15 second tips that I've been doing on TikTok lately. And so I put this little... Wait, t you're on TikTok? TikTok. Yeah, you know, that's a little... Right, right, yeah, I heard thing. of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, they, the, at any rate, about... Um, so the, the issue is just like, the, what is, what is one of the biggest muscles in a woman's body is your glutes, right? Your butt muscles. So Wait, you you're do, on TikTok? <laughs> blue, I'm confused. The, 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 the publishing companies these days want you to do little things. So I kind of got into doing a little bit of this and that. And then I got more into it. And I said, OK, I can put some very cool tips for the female brain, for female brain power, that in, out of the book in on these little uh, TikTok so, things. So. Wow. So you've done that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, great. I've been doing that for a couple of months. So the one that's, the one that's gotten the most excitement, the, the most, whatever, six or 7,000 views in the last week or so was I did one on basically it, you do a thousand butt squeezes a day it's a way to increase your female brain power so when you're brushing your teeth when you're sitting at your computer when you're standing at the grocery store just think butt squeezes <laughs> <laughs> excuse me ma'am you can re remove your card now no. <laughs> busy <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, so... You got some take home from tonight, right? You at least know that you're supposed to do butts. Well, and the books were meant to, probably, you know. So yeah, this right. is not just a female thing, but that's okay. Um, so uh, that's that's super interesting. And But also, so what I... The reason I brought up Rhonda is that she has a super difficult story. Her daughter is a mess. Um, she's She falls... Right, falling. I might add, I've written quite a bit about falling. Um, did a big series for the New York Times about peop about pe older adults falling and how basically preventable it is. But you, with Rhonda, to work with her on balance, and I mean, she she kind of gets transformed. So tell me the idea of the the. The, remember, everything in the body is kind of homeostasis and balance and harmony and what, what is. You know, if you think also of a horse, when, when they go down, you know, when a horse goes down and can't get back up and move, that's it. Their, their life is over. Well, think of yourself that way too. It's like you have to keep moving. Otherwise, you know, your, your life is going to be over and your brain is going to, you know, basically rot. So, well, uh, right down to her pronunciation. Yes. So talk about that. Yeah. How, so, so, you know, a lot of the so balance. So there's a lot of lot of there's all kinds of of signals that come. If you think about stand, think of all of you think about standing on two feet, and you're gonna lift up one. You're gonna stand on that one foot. That's not so easy for a lot of us, and you know, especially you know as we get older. But so, but it it just that's incredibly stimulating to your brain, to your whole nervous system, because it's feeding back information on exactly you know on, on gravity on, on how you're going to have to 
signal all those little tiny muscles in the leg that's trying to hold you up, all the other ones off the ground. And it's sending signals up to your motor cortex, which is kind of like the headband area across your brain. It's also sending to, through your cerebellum. And the cerebellum, you may have read the part in the book about the right, cerebellum. about just how connected it is to absolutely it's everything. It's so cool because 80% of its connections are, are actually not uh, to the balance. It's go also going through the emotion areas and into the cognition areas, not to make you think or anything, but it's, it's, editing, it's editing any mistakes that are happening. You know, it's, the, it's, it's for the balance. It's kind of editing mistakes that you may be making. So it stimulates all kinds of parts of your brain, the balance part. So, and it can actually help not only cognition, but mood and stimulate your entire neuromuscular system, including your speech. So then it ends, the Rhonda section, with I asked her to practice alternate nostril breathing. And that's actually a big deal. And so talk about, and it was completely new to me, how many people have actually Raise your hand if you know what alternate nostril breathing is. Oh my God, everybody oh, knows about baby. it. Oh, baby. Okay. We, got, we got a sophisticated <laughs> audience okay, here so tonight. Okay. For our audience out there in the ether, tell, let's, let's talk about that. So um, it's, it's a technique that's been used for actually probably thousands of years kind of in the meditation world through the, you know, the Tibetan and the Buddhist meditation world has been using alternate nostril breathing for a long, long time. So they discovered that it does something helpful to your nervous system. So I'll, I'll, t I'll just show you guys what to do. If those of you don't know, if you just take your right finger, your right index finger, cover your right nostril and breathe in through your left and then cover your left and breathe out through your right. And then do the same thing again. Breathe in through your left, out through your right, and in through your left, and out through your right. Now you're going to continue and breathe in through your right, and out through your left, and in through your right, out through your left. And for the final three, you're going to just do normally breathe in your nostrils, and then out for both of them, and in, and out, and in, and out. And, and what that helps do is it, it calms your kind of, your vagal nervous, your parasympathetic nervous system. Also, all the little hairs in your nostril on one side, it kind of signals the brain that something different is happening, so it really focuses your attention on that in breath that's triggering all the little hairs on that nostril and then the out breath on the other. So it's triggering lots of nervous system to pay attention, focus, but also it's calming your vagal nerve system, your parasympathetic nerve system down. So it's, it's a way that you can just calm your whole stress system down during the day. You can do this anytime. Somebody's going to think you're maybe blowing your nose if you have your mask on or something. So but <laughs> well, I started it right when I was reading that section. I have really bad allergies, so <clears throat> I was having trouble with one of my nostrils. So um, then I blew my nose, and it was, it's, it actually, I think it's, you know, whatever it is that you can do that centers you. I mean, what, what this book is, it's the other layered part of it. It, there's the science, there's the stories, and there's the prescriptive side. And what am I missing? Which other parts of which layer it. am I? I yeah, think you've got those all the sides. <clears throat> yeah. um, and it also discusses, uh, you know, it gives you more um, tips, and especially sleep, which is just everybody's tormentor. Um, well, not everybody, like my husband, but. Um, uh, but sleep, let's, before we, I want to get to questions quickly because there are a bunch and they're really good. So, um, but let's talk about sleep because. So let's, let's ask the audience for a minute though, just for a minute to see how many of you have, uh, in the course of a month, have any couple of nights that you might have trouble sleeping? How many of you? Okay. Oh, no one. So like, okay, so that's like the majority of the audience. So um, the reason that's important, especially for the female brain, or as we go through the second half of life, is that you want to do everything you can to keep your cognition active. 
And one of the things that happens when we sleep, so all during the day when we're thinking, there's all of this activity between all the neurons throughout our whole brain, and it's making all kinds of proteins. It makes all kinds of debris just kind of like gunk up your whole system. By the end of the day, there's a lot of garbage up there. <laughs> there's a lot of garbage in the brain. And when you sleep, the cells in your brain kind of slightly retract. They kind of shrink down a little bit, opening up all these little pathways for the river of the cerebral spinal fluid to kind of just flush out all the garbage, which there's other cells that actually help with that too, just to get rid of the garbage. So sleep, if you're not getting at least six hours you know, of really good sleep a night when you're in your 50s, and actually when you start in your 60s and 70s, it, you, know, you really should be more like up at the seven or eight hours sleep to try to just flush the garbage out of your brain. So I just wanted to tell you the reason why you should really focus on some of the aspects of sleep. And I gave you a bunch of, I give you, I give you Luann's prescription for sleep in here, which is, you know, <laughs> it, if, if you do anything in terms of habit change that's going to make your brain healthier, it's focus on getting your sleep cleaned up <laughs> and clean up your circuits in your brain. But it can be so much easier said than done oh boy don't i know it i mean i you know i've i've worked at that for years and it's finally it's finally getting a little bit better i still have a few nights a month where something's going on and i just mm -hmm. something is rattling my around in my brain and right. i just can't i mean know. and you you give us all these impossible tasks like don't eat after like noon six o'clock oh no 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 <laughs> what not eat after noon it's D don't don't drink don't, oh, don't have coffee. caffeine especially right, for right. Fe females we me we metabolize caffeine slower so if you have a cup of coffee at noon it can still be in your brain at midnight oh wow okay so you chocolate no oh. dark the, the dark chocolate kind i think mm -hmm. milk chocolate's a little less just look at the but caffeinated mm -hmm. drinks you know those energy drinks or caffeinated mm -hmm. drinks or anything caffeinated in the afternoon is probably still going to be in your brain at midnight mm -hmm. so just, you don't, it can't, obviously we're gonna, you can't do everything perfectly, but if you, if you know kind of what will make it clean up your habits, then you can at least set, can at least like if you're sailing, you can at least set that as your point that you're gonna go towards, mm -hmm. however erratically. Right, be kind to yourself, oh. as they say in the self Very much kind biz. to yourself. Um, but I just have to ask you, I, when I saw no wine, I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, I have to say that before I came here tonight, I was a little early and I went to Boulevard and went to the bar. <laughs> Why is this funny? And, and it was heaven. I mean, I, of course, I shouldn't have because who knows, I might get COVID. And, but um, it was just, Lovely, and so there's 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 the wine, but there's also the ceremony of the wine, and the environment, and, and the social part of it. And t if I had ordered a diet coke, it just would not. <laughs> or well, I diet coke would have been bad for you. What cranberry juice? Whatever I could have, it, or I don't know. It wouldn't be the same because alcohol is is what they call a social lubricant, and it's an anti-anxiety. It's one of the best anti-anxiety medicines, the oldest anti-anxiety So, medicine. But you say, Luann, you say, just go cold turkey, like none yeah. at all. And well, I'm let me tell you what happens with this. With, we're talking about sleep, okay? The oh. sleep piece is what sleep. we're talking about. Context of sleep. Context. The context of sleep is that if you drink, if you drink alcohol, it may put you to sleep later at night, but you will then wake up a couple of hours later. It, alcohol then, because as the blood level drops, it wakes you up. And it's also dosage dependent. It's like how much, how much you drink. So I suggest that people, if they're going to have, try to really do something religious about the habits for sleep. They might try having a glass of wine at six o'clock at dinner. And that's it. Because if you so have that's any okay? closer, that's okay. But any closer, any closer to bed is any closer to bed is going to mess up okay. your sleep. Oh, that's okay. We can do that. <laughs> Listen, you were at five o'clock over there, Boulevard. You were within. You I were within my limits, Katie. I was so happy. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, okay. So let's start with a, a question from a man. <clears throat> Remember them? Okay. <laughs> we men. We men are wondering about women's sexual desire after the, quote, upgrade. Well, that, that's a context. And so thank you for letting me know that's a question from a man. Because, um, you know, it's like your mother said, right? When you have a lot of sex drive and libido, that, that means that that's a, something really important to you in your life. And 
that hormone, when it's not there, it's not causing that behavior, right? So if that hormone is not there, then that behavior is not going to be there. Even for men. I mean, if we gave this guy that out the question, if we gave him an anti, if we gave a testosterone blocking agent for a week, he wouldn't care about sex either. <laughs> Believe it or not, guys, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> At any rate, so um, the, the, it's, it's a hard time, I think, also for couples because women's testosterone level, which is what gives them their sex drive to their libido, comes from that ovary follicle where all those eggs are, and then the eggs are gone, the follicles are gone, and we're not making the level of testosterone we used to make mm -hmm. by a long shot. And so women's sex drive, uh, unless you have a new partner, a woman, woman at any age, when she gets a new partner for about six months, she'll have her libido six back. Six whole months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. So make hay while the sun shines, right? <laughs> so if you have a new partner, but otherwise you end up, um, you know, basically having, not having the hormone and not having the libido as much as you did. However, lots of women in my clinic will ask for having a bit of testosterone back in their hormone replacement therapy, which can give their libido back to them. Mm -hmm. uh, some women don't like it because it makes them very irritable and kind of like feeling like out of my way MF, you know, <laughs> that feeling from testosterone. Some women do not like that. So, and do you get the sense that they're doing it for themselves or they're doing it for their... For the, usually partner. it's for the relationship. I mean, it, it, it goes both ways. It's individual, mm -hmm. some individual. I mean, I think women who've had a high libido all of their life and all of a sudden they start not having that hormone and not having that feeling, they may really miss it a lot mm -hmm. and then and want it back. So it's individual. And some women, and also, you know, I've had women where... Um, I remember having one woman in the clinic, we gave her testosterone back to her. The pharmacy made a mistake and gave her the male dosage instead of the female oh, really? dosage. <laughs> she called me up about two weeks later. She says, Dr. Frizzendine, um, it's just kind of an embarrassing thing to say, but um, you know, ever since we started using that testosterone, I'm, she was a school teacher. She was a school teacher. She said, I'm having to go into the ladies' room in between classes and um, relieve myself. <laughs> <laughs> now I know it, what it feels like to be a 19-year-old boy. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> what she says, that's great. Well, she wasn't she's, oh, was interrupting her life. But, <laughs> and, the, and lots of women find that it makes them have an orgasm way too fast. It just kind of goes blip, blip, it's over. Oh, interesting. So it's, a, it's an individual thing, and I think it's worth, it's worth trying out, test driving, feeling how, you know, the other compound, DHEA, which I talk about in there, is, is, a, is a precursor to, to testosterone. And a lot of women can get that put in their, um, their custom-made <laughs> pharmaceutical hormone mm -hmm. replacement therapy from the compounding pharmacies will do that for you. So it's, from what you're saying, it sounds like the hormone replacement therapy, it's a, it, it isn't they, that you just get prescribed a patch. I mean, it has to be pretty individualized. Well, one size doesn't fit all with this. Mm -hmm. But you know, one size didn't fit all with the birth control pill either, or with mm -hmm. it. I mean, one size never has fit all in medicine. We try to we try to lump everybody. We try to make medicines fit eighty percent of the people, but mm -hmm. you know, it never fits people perfectly. So, this is a little bit more difficult because there aren't enough doctors out there doing this and trying right. to individualize it. I don't know how many of your girlfriends have, you know, not been able to find any, but there are very few women, and there are very few women doctors or doctors in San Francisco As you now said. doing yeah. this. Or who even learned. Yeah, who even it. learned. And some of them, are the older ones that knew, that knew before are retiring, so we've got this big hole. So any of you doc, young doctors out there, any people that's going to be training, please train in the hormone replacement therapy area because we need you. So speaking of which, um, here's a question. Could, could I benefit from HRT at age 69, or is it too late? Well, okay, that's, that's a whole, that's, that, I mean, that's a, I think it's a very individual question, right? And in the 1990s, this is, this is going to be a little kind of off the to topic, but basically you would, be, you would be told by your doctor no at this point. That ten, it's 10 years, you, they, there's a 10 year window from, from menopause, say in your early 50s to your, till about 60, when it's considered okay to start taking HRT. It used to be in the 1990s that, especially for women that would have um, osteoporosis or start to have thinning bones, that doctors would put them on estrogen at that point in time, even up until their mid 70s. So it depends on what, it depends on what your individual situation is and what you're treating. Um, and <clears throat> you kind of addressed this, but maybe it, it bears um, repeating the question, can HRT help depression? 
So it's important to know that estrogen does, is not an antidepressant. It doesn't treat clinical depression. However, in that transition phase that you're going through, aka the perimenopause, and the, the, the bit of the postmenopause, estrogen has been shown to be um, a support to your mood and just makes you not feel quite so um, joyless and dark, which is different than, you know, we're talking about clinical depression as a type of thing where you're not maybe eating or sleeping, you're ruminating, you're not able to go to work, you're, you know, you have a true on biological clinical depression. That you need an actual antidepressant for. So it's important to distinguish those two. But the hormone replacement therapy does give a, um, a, a boost to a lot of women's moods who don't have the clinical depression, yes. Mm -hmm. And you're, in fact, you are not a huge fan of drugs in general, particularly things like you have a story about Benadryl in here. <laughs> um, How many of you have ever taken Benadryl or taken Tylenol PM or Advil PM or one of those things, you know? So the story about the drugs that are Benadryl or diphenhydramine, so you become a, you got to start reading the labels because it's a drug that's it's in the category called... It has a lot of um, anticholinergic effects, and choline is really important for your memory. So something like Benadryl. What's it called again? Anticholinergic effects. So it blocks acetylcholine, which is your it's your main it's your main neurochemical used for memory. It's one of the main ones used for memory. What happens, especially in older people, like over the age of forty, <laughs> probably all of us, is that and even. You know, is that if you take one of these medicines like Benadryl, did you ever, did you ever feel like that, you know, that foggy feeling in the morning, mm -hmm. you just can't quite wake up. And like, I, if I take a Benadryl, I can't quite wake up until about noon and the next day. It, I, I'm feeling like I'm walking in a fog. And because I don't drink caffeine anymore, <laughs> I don't have my little, you know, my little safety net there. Benadryl or those kinds of drugs will give you brain fog the next day. And some people who start taking it every night, like I talk about this one case in the book where her daughter brought her mother to, to me because her mother was completely losing her memory. She it was able to not remember anything where she had two weeks ago and come to find out she had started taking Benadryl every night. And her memory just went south very quickly. So you've got to be careful with over-the-counter drugs or, and lots, lots of the antidepressant drugs especially the older fashioned ones, and the ones they're now using for, for patients that, for pain, they give you nortriptyline or amitriptyline or, you know, Elevil. One of these pills to help with pain, the neurologists give, can also, they're anticholinergic and can also mess up your memory. So it's really important if you've started anything new and you start to have any kind of memory effects or any other side effects, please look first to the medicines you're taking before you think it's, you're going to have Alzheimer's within the next year. Don't freak out about that. In chapter 14, I go into a lot of this about the... It, and you said there's been a lot of interest in chapter 14. Yeah, is, a lot of people. I just did a long interview, two interviews last week for chapter 14. Uh, one was for the um, the, the um, Shriver. You, you can remember, Luann. I know you can. <laughs> I hope so, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the 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 um, you know um, reversing Alzheimer's or the the group of like you know prevention, mostly pr the prevention of Alzheimer's in women because you know women have er of every of every three Alzheimer's cases, two are women, and a piece of it is because women live a couple years longer. So. The age piece is, is a chunk of that. But the other piece is like an unknown. And so a, cur a current hypothesis that they're working on, which those studies won't be out for another five or six years, is that it's because of the menopause transition and losing all of our estrogen between age 49 and 53 that sets us up to have a more, a pr more prevalence of Alzheimer's. Oh, wow. So those women that may have the, the ApoE4 variant or two of them, or have a history of their mother, grandmother, everybody having Alzheimer's, um, wanting to have them take estrogen for prevention. You'll, you'll hear a lot about that probably in the next four or five years. That's kind of become a, a hypothesis that they're working on. So stay, t stay tuned for that one. Yeah, that's super interesting. And are you a proponent of um, doing things like learning to play chess or an instrument or a language? or? 
do it only if it's fun. I mean, no, I mean, I don't know. It's like, that's, if they've been, you know, they're doing the crossword puzzles or doing chess or starting to learn a new language, all of these things that are um, supposed to help your cognition, um, do them if they're fun. Because if they're not fun, it's not going to get your dopamine going. It's not going to be uh, something that you're going to stick with. So I would take up new things that are fun for you. Mm-hmm. And if you get the side benefit of, yep, cognitive yeah. boost okay you know, like this woman so um some of you in the community may <clears throat> may know um brenda way who's for 50 years run odc the dance company in town and mm. she told me the story of her mother in her 90s her mother in her mid 90s started a tap dancing troupe <laughs> oh my and God. i tell her story this tap dancing troupe that she would go around all of the senior living places with her troupe and they do tap dancing performances. And, you know, she, I think she, she, she passed away a few years ago at 105. At any rate, she was, the, the movement and the, the tap dancing was, was her, pa- became her passion. Well, that reminds me of an important thing that you touch on in the book, which is this whole question of connection and its polar opposite being isolation. So there's social isolation versus loneliness. Um, which are two very distinctly different things. But if somebody would go, went around to senior living centers, to, tap dancing, <laughs> I mean, that's like the ultimate in connection. But you, you also underscore this with um, just how important connection is and how we're just at the tail end, we hope, of so much lack of connection, yes. which has been so detrimental to our health, I, th- I think. What, what do you think? I agree. I think that, you know, I think it wasn't, you know, our, our shutdowns and our isolation from the pandemic has been, um, for all of us, it's, it's been a little peek into this to this, to the world of being isolated. And it depends on, you know, what your social situation is and who you've been living with. So some people have had more than others. But I think that it's the lack of stimulation. People are really starting to really, really great on people. And I think probably older people in particular. Where Older people in, in particular. Because yeah. I think what a lot of families have done is a lot of families have just stopped doing things with the older people in their families because they don't want to expose them, keep them safe. And so the older people in their families have ended up having basically being much more isolated from their families. and. The root, the, you know, the habits of two or three years, people are just leaving the older people in their families out now, which um, I think we haven't even we haven't heard we haven't heard the end of that story yet. It, it, yeah, um, but and circling back to this question of intimacy, I mean, um, physical intimacy isn't a binary thing. It's like not sex or no sex. I mean, I think that what you talk about, you know, a hug. For heaven's sakes, and we're holding hands. And and why is that important? Well, you know, physical touch is really important, no matter no matter what you know size or shape it's in, and it's, it basically communicates that you matter to me. And what is it doing physically? And so, you know, just neurologically, it really, mm-hmm. you know, a, a twenty. So it's funny how science does these things, but a twenty-second hug releases oxytocin in your brain. Everybody knows about and oxytocin that is the mm-hmm. called the love hormone. It's not oxycontin. It's oxytocin. <laughs> it's oxytocin. <laughs> Maybe some of the same feeling. I don't know, but at any rate, there's, um, you know, that that's touch is so important neurologically. Uh, to just indicate that you matter to somebody, that that they that they they validate that that you care, and I think that um, um, that doing everything you can from every direction, the movement, the physical touch, the communication with others, being part of a part of groups or part of a community, all of those things really matter more and more. I think as we go through the decades. Um, than we ever thought possible. I think it's a it's a 15 year they've done 15 year decrease in your longevity if you are socially isolated. Yeah, that's a whopper. Uh, it is a whopper. <laughs> it's very very scary. So all of you tonight, that doesn't count because you're all here. You know, you're all participating in a group and in a community. So. Yeah, and and I think that there's a lot to be said for everyone sitting there physically, even if you're sitting next to a stranger. There's something about it. Um, okay, here's a question. I have no clue what they're asking. Um, 
What's better, bioidentical or pharmaceutical, and how are they different? I get asked that question a lot, oh. and it's it's <laughs> <laughs> so um, so the word bioidentical means that it's going to be exactly the same as the hormone made from your body or from your ovaries, and um, the bioidentical ones. So so. Bioidentical ones are also made in the lab. A lab, a, you know, they're going to synthesize a, a, an identical hormone to what you have in the lab versus um, synthesizing one that's, that's sort of like the ones you make but is slightly different. So the receptors aren't all the same. So the big to-do about taking bioidentical versus the synthetic ones is we already have all of the receptors for the bioidentical ones. Why not just use those? And that makes sense and that that, that usually, that's what we usually start with now, you know. We use 17 beta estradiol, which is the bioidentical estrogen in every way that we can to, you know, to try to do hormone replacement therapy. And for the progesterone, we try to use natural progesterone since we have the receptors for those. But that doesn't mean that the synthetic ones don't also work. They're quite robust. Almost all of the hormones in the birth control pills are all synthetic, so they're not making them bioidentical there yet. Um, so that's, uh, they're not, it's not that they're necessarily better or worse, it's this that they may have fewer side effects. So we, we like to start with them, and if you can get balanced on those. I remember, the, remember anybody ever heard of the drug called Premarin, the one from horse urine? And, you know, it has 17 different estrogens in it. And um, Is that a menopause drug? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's um, estrogen made from the, the urine of pregnant mares. And so before we, th the reason it started that way is because it was before we knew how to synthesize it in the lab, we didn't know how. So we started off by just collecting it from pregnant mares. Wow. So that's how it started out for tr before we could synthesize it in the lab. And um, it's not that it's a, it's a bad compound. I don't know, anybody ever take that in this audience? I mean, it's, it's, it's a fine, it's a fine, it's 17 different estrogens in it. And um, three of them are actually better from the brain than our bioidentical ones are, they've found. So, you know, the jury's still out on that, so I wouldn't just throw the you know bioidentical ones as as being the the be all and end all. So I think working with what's working best for your body and gives you symptom relief, and gives you um, um, you know better sleep and less hot flashes and less brain fog and more joy in your life. That's what you should be on. Mm. But and but speaking of which, somebody asked, talk about. HRT withdrawal. Oh, that's a that's one because we even had a little exchange about some of that the other day because doctors you now it's like it's a complicated thing you get on that in age fifty and then age sixty the doctors are telling being told to take you off of it right and that's nobody really wants to come nobody wants to go through withdrawal because if you take estrogen away from somebody you will go through hot flashes vaginal dryness. Um, et cetera, et cetera, joint pains, brain fog. I bet um, huge depression. I mean, I'm guessing sleep, sleep deprivation as well. I mean, it, uh, it just, it sounds awful. To so there's a whole, so the jury is still out on because the, the, um, the, you know, the research studies are a little bit behind where women are now. I mean, a lot of women in their 60s are still taking their patch. I know I'm still taking my patch. And, um, I personally don't plan to stop it unless I need to for some reason. But the, 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 um, the medical um, lore, right, I mean, the, the medical guidelines right now say that you should have women on it for no more than 10 years. You sh definitely should not put someone on it 10 years post-menopause. Mm -hmm. That's the current uh, thinking. Oh, okay. Um, so we don't have that much time left. Uh, I want to make sure we get any, any more questions that we can from the audience. And since we have Luann right here, uh, and I, I'm trying to put my finger on why I found this so epiphanous. It felt like, you know how it felt? It felt like a validation. I've worried that the fact that I've become so busy um, later in life is that I'm worried I'm running out of time. Is that something that people say to you? 
um, they just feel a, an increased passion about what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, and it's not. I mean, it's not so much you're running out of time, but you do kind of feel like, well, I better get it. I, I mean, like, I've got this energy and this focus right now. I, I want to do it while I can. And just, not just that. And this gets to how lamentable it is that um, older people, women and men in society, aren't valued. Um, is that I feel like I have this accumulated wisdom that, and you talk in the book about how men are considered wise, older men are considered wise, and older women are considered cute. And, <laughs> um, and I feel like it's been all these years of what I've been doing professionally that has enabled me to do what I'm doing now with my Lost Women of Science huge thing that I just started doing two years ago so um so are you it it seems however from these anecdotes in the book that you have trouble convincing women of this that they have this wisdom and accumulated knowledge to impart to the world is is that true Uh, exactly I mean I think that you know what comes to mind is that phrase a co-created reality right so, you know, a person at any age, whatever it is, we respond to how people treat us, right? We respond to what the culture expects of us. We respond to what society and our family and others expect of us. And then we, you know, and if the expectation is that we become cute old ladies, right, rather than um, vessels of wisdom... <laughs> <laughs> to help, you know, to me, I, I mean, nothing better for me than to try and reach down and give a helping hand to, to younger sisters, you know, just to, to younger women and help them along their path. I mean, I feel a passion for that. And I just feel like, you know, if, if women felt that, that that's what was their purpose, whatever it is that's your purpose, that it's going to be validated, ex, you know, rewarded, waited for, needed, you know, by society, that's a whole different kettle of fish than thinking you're going to be an old, cute lady. I mean, come on now. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but it's not, I'm not planning to be an old, cute lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, so I, I haven't actually asked you th- if this yet. We talked about it the other day on the phone. Um, if there's one quick pithy message that you want people to take away from this, what would it be? Well, I think what I'd like people to really get from the book, just in a nutshell, is that, you know, this time of life that we typically call the menopause transition is a time when the female brain remodels itself for the better allowing us to be more clear and have a new power and also have an intense laser-focused purpose in life if we know how to seize it. Yeah, I, it's funny you say that because it, there's a kind of clarity, I think, that, that comes. And yet it's a little bit at war with becoming a grandparent. It's like, I'm actually, I'm, t- of course, dying to become a grandparent, but I'm a little bit ambivalent because it's like, wait a minute, I'm busy. <laughs> and, and I've done that. But, I, but, you, but we, you've, you talk about this in the book, is this huge love that, that women who become grandmothers, like this deep, deep, deep love, and then you can hand the kid back. So <laughs> it's... it's it, um, it's so, what I love most about the book, I mean, I love a lot of things, but that it's holistic that way, that you don't really reject anything. And there's no strident tone at all. It's just, uh, it's really just a, it's a tour de force of a book. I've never seen anything like it. So Thank you, Katie. That means a lot well, coming from you. Thank you, Luann. I mean, I was just shocked I mean, when I said, oh, wow, um, when I saw that you had done it. So we have pretty much run out of time. Uh, and so I would like to um, give our thanks to Dr. Luann Brizendine, author of 
the upgrade, how the female brain gets stronger and better in midlife and beyond for being with us tonight. Copies of Dr. Brizendine's book are available for purchase here at the club or at your local bookstore. I would love to urge you to do that as well. If you would like to support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programs possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Katie Hafner. Thank you and take care. Katie, thank you.